they hand you this f of x and they say, hey, it is a probability density function. So we're not asking like, oh, is it or isn't it? They're telling us it is. And that's helpful because we can make certain assumptions about it if that's the case, right? Namely, this is that second condition that we know all probability density functions must obey. Um, I've substituted instead of negative infinity and infinity here, I've put in a and b because practically um, you will usually get an a and a b. It's defined in this domain, okay? So what I'm going to do is, because I know it's a probability density function, I'm going to make this statement for this particular function, okay? So I'm going to say my integral is not just from a to b, my boundaries are 0 to 6, fantastic. Now here comes the function part, which has to include, even though it's slightly awkward, it has to include this unknown, right, k. Now I did get asked the question, it was a good question, like, hey, this is multiple choice, right? Can I just like try those values out, just put it in? and then see what happens. The short answer is absolutely you can, um, but you may be taking either a really lucky way, it's like, oh, my first answer worked, or a really unlucky way, um, which is that I had to get all the way to answer D and then like I had to try all, I had to waste all this time trying A, B, and C, okay? Not to mention, of course, we wanna be able to handle a question like this even when we don't get given options, right? We wanna be able to just work it out, which we can. So I'm gonna take this, <coughs> gonna integrate with respect to X, and the thing is, I know what the answer to this question is because it's a probability density function. All my probabilities ought to add to one, okay? Now, at this point, I'm like, okay, calculus hat back on, okay? Um, I'm going to integrate this guy, and my primitive function will be x, careful, yeah, it's gonna be x squared over 90. And you can just mentally check, like, if I differentiate that, will I come back? Yes, I will, okay? Um, but then that k, I'm not differentiating, remember? I'm integrating. The k becomes kx, very good. So this is going to be something that gets evaluated when I put in my boundaries, which are naught and six, okay? That's a little bit weird. We usually um, know all the stuff over here and then we get an answer out, but we're doing this in reverse. We actually know what the answer is. Um, we know the end at the beginning and now we have to see what this k is, right? Now that's all right because these 0 and 6 are going to replace all my x's. So all the x's will go, be replaced by numbers. The only unknowns will be k, all right? So let's just go ahead, make sure we know what our working will look like. Here's my upper boundary, 6 squared on 90 plus 6k. Are you okay with my substitution? That looks all right, okay? And then I'm subtracting my lower boundary. And I notice, as happens frequently, um, there are x terms in both of these spots, right? So when the 0 goes in here, and then when the zero goes in here, it all just disappears, right? So I'm just subtracting zero. Is that okay? Um, that's nice, that's equal to one. And at this point, all I need to do is uh, simplify this stuff, make k the subject. Is that all right? Um, six squared on 90, 36 on 90. Oh, what's 36 on 90? So two fifths. Six, oh, two fifths? Two fifths. What is the common? Oh, 18, of course, okay. So I've got two fifths plus six k equals one. So I'm gonna subtract gives me three fifths and that means our final line k will equal uh, 3 over 30 which is 1 over 10. Is that one of our answers? Well, that's a relief isn't it? Okay so option C that's how we did it. Okay so like I said you're like ah oh, this calculus stuff I know how to do it's just that we, tr we take this property of a probability density function and we use that to be able to work out these unknowns on the left hand side, which is a slightly different perspective. Now, I think you guys can have a go at eight um, in your own time. You can see, again, they hand you a probability density function. They're asking you to find some probabilities. Let's just make sure you're heading on the right track. I'll do the first line and then I'll let you guys take it from there before I, um, I do want to quickly talk you through these. So question eight. Uh, what's the probability density function that they give us? f of x equals what? 2x on 25 within what domain? 0 to 5, thank you very much. And then I'm assuming it says 0 otherwise, yeah? Um, and you can see this is what we were talking about yesterday, right? This happens all the time because you're like, this function looks like my data, but only in this little window. So just take it in that window and ignore it for the rest of it, okay? Um, now, they want us then to work out a series of probabilities. So for this first one, our boundaries are from one and a half to two and a half. Like so. 
So I can get an integral, I can interpret an integral out of this probability that they're asking for, right? I'm going to have my definite integral. Where do I get my boundaries from? I think because there's a few different places I could take it from. Is it not from it's, it's, just, it's just from here, right? It's from this particular question. Um, it's not from here because I already know that would give me everything. So that would be one. I don't need to know that. I want this specific little section of the probabilities. Then I put in my function, 2x on 25. And then off I go. I reckon you guys could do that half in your sleep. Okay. Now, I just quickly want you to have a look. Can you pick up that piece of paper? Because um, you'll be able to do all this question, I reckon, on your own. I think you'll be fine with question two on this piece of paper as well. I just want you to have a look at question three. Um, so you can signal to me that you're ready by putting your pen down and then picking this up so you can have a look at it closely. So finish whatever line of working you're on and then just show me you've got that piece of paper in your eyes. Thanks Eddie, that's very helpful. Okay, all right. Have a look at it with me. It says, let f of x equal, they give you a function. Um, it's defined on the closed interval 0, 4, so there's our boundaries. Okay. Now, part A says, show that, and they give you an integral, it equals 1. Why are they asking this? Why would they care about some integral equaling 1? Think about what we've been doing. They're trying, to, they're trying to meet the conditions. They're trying to meet the conditions of probability density functions, right? So they're checking this one. Okay. But then they say, part B, show nevertheless that f of x is not a valid probability density function, and they even give you a hint. Now let's think about this, right? We've already satisfied, if part A is right, we've satisfied one condition. What's the other one again? Can't be less than zero. It's always going to be zero or above. So that tells you, even though you don't know what this graph looks like, it tells you what you're expecting to find. There's probably going to be some negatives in there, and I need to show that, okay? So we're going to leave the rest of this lesson for you guys to get your head wrapped around this, this world in which there's a lot of familiar stuff, but the language in which they ask it and the notation is different, okay? Question two, which is the, the first question on there. Um, I didn't address this because I wanted you to get to it and think, what does that mean? The question's quite long before they get to the A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, the second part of the question says, determine whether or not each function is a probability density function. We've covered how to do that. You're looking for those two conditions. And then there's this little kicker there. It says, if it is a probability density function, because some of them aren't, if it is one, find its mode. And then they give you this little hint. They say, look for global maxima. And you're like, I don't know what either of those things mean. So pause for a minute and remember. Um, one of the examples that I gave you yesterday was to imagine a probability density function that represented the heights of our class. Do you, do you remember that? So I, I don't know. I, I drew something like, like that. Okay. Now, if this really is a probability density function, then I can use it to find the mode. So long as I remember what mode is. Um, in, a, in a group of scores, we've got mode, mean, and median. Right? Mean's the average, median is the middle score. What's mode represent? The most, most occurring The most frequently occurring, the most common one. Right? Now, if this is a probability density function, I should be able to look at this and say, Oh, the most common height in the classroom must be the one that is most probable if I picked one of you at random, right? The most probable thing will be the mode, or vice versa, the mode will be the most probable thing, okay? So what this means is the way you can find a mode on a probability density function is to go back to last topic and say, where is our maximum value? And that's why they say, um, look for global maxima. Now, that word global, think, 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 the word global is important because on the basis of your function, you might not find the global maximum at a turning point, right? This is a turning point, but you can pretty easily think of a function where the global maximum does not occur at a turning point. Let me give you a couple, right? Here's one. Here's a probability density function, right? I have a turning point, it's down here. It's a minimum. I'm looking for the most common thing, not the least common thing. So therefore, I'm going to find it at an end point. Does that make sense? Um, well, I mean, in this, I can have what we call bimodal data. Does that, do you remember that? It's like, oh, if I have, if half of us are this height and the other half are that height, they're both the mode. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, or just as easily, just as easily, imagine if I had a function that looked like this. 
This stationary point right there, it's a maximum stationary point. It's, sorry, I should say a maximum turning point. But it's not the global maximum because you still have this endpoint over here because of however your domain is defined um, that actually ends up being the real maximum. Okay, So you have to search for those. And that's why I go back to your notes on optimization if this is like not ringing bells because that's part of why we learned this. Okay.